Welcome to the Brute Strength Podcast, bringing you worldwide experts from all areas of health and fitness. We cover training, nutrition, coaching, and mindset. Welcome your host, strength and conditioning coach, 2012 and 2013 CrossFit Games champ, Michael Cashew. Mind, body, brute. Welcome back. This is Mike Cashew, and you're listening to the Brute Strength Podcast. This is round two with Chris Duffin. Chris is the owner of Kabuki Strength, as well as a world record holder. He's the only human being ever to deadlift over a thousand pounds for multiple reps. He got two reps, almost three, and he's one of the greatest power lifters of all time. In our first episode, we talked all about his upbringing and just his personal story. And the reason I wanted to break it up into two pieces is he just has an absolutely incredible story to tell. And I felt it would be a disservice to you and to him to just kind of breeze over that in a couple questions. So you can listen to that in the earlier episode that we did. This one's all about equipment and biomechanics and injury prevention and just exercise science in general. And this is a topic specifically equipment is a topic I almost never talk about with people because I'm usually uninterested. But with Chris, he understands biomechanics extremely well. And so I felt like there were there would be some really cool things to learn from a guy like this because he is trying to understand it from a coaching perspective, an athlete perspective, and also from the perspective of a manufacturer. So <clears throat> we start out talking about uh, blog posts actually that he made on drinking whiskey before uh, deadlifting, and I thought it would it would be kind of a joke, but we get into quite a long discussion about why this is actually beneficial and how this has been this is people have been drinking alcohol and lifting weights for hundreds of years, and it was actually it it, it has since been banned as a uh, performance enhancing substance. And so it was kind of an interesting little conversation to start it off with. And then we talk about shiny object syndrome. He made a blog post about creating a six month rule around adopting new training habits. And I wanted to bring up a few things in the industry that I think could be shiny objects, such as should beginners be doing high volume programs like Smolov, things like steel maces and breathing masks? And I just wanted to get his take on them because he is a scientist of sorts and I thought he would have a very educated and thought out opinion. We talk about those, we talk about the number one tool or piece of equipment that people aren't using that they should, the one that they are using that they should stop using. And then we talk a little bit about rehab specifically uh, for the hamstrings, which I feel like is a gap in a lot of coaches' knowledge. Uh, we go all over the place with this one. Chris is one of the most intelligent guys I've ever had on the show, and it was a pleasure to dive into some subjects that I usually don't touch. So before we get this show started, if you haven't done so already, Please share this with a friend if you enjoy it. Head to iTunes, leave me a quick review, and hit that subscribe button. Enjoy the show. Chris, what's up, dude? Welcome back. How are you? Doing great. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me on again. Really excited to uh, continue the discussion. Absolutely, man. So for those of you who didn't listen to our first episode, the first one was all about Chris's story growing up and kind of getting to where... I think we we got all the way to your powerlifting career. And the reason that I wanted to do that is because you literally have one of the most powerful stories of any person I've ever heard of. And I thought it would be a disservice to breeze through that in a few questions, right? I wanted to spend an entire hour or hour and a half or whatever we did really diving into your story because I think it is it is interesting, it is moving, and it is it can be incredibly inspiring for people. So for those of you who haven't listened to that one yet, 
go do this, go do that right after you listen to this one. Uh, so where we're going to pick up is I think the last thing we talked about was you becoming the first person in history to deadlift 1000 pounds for multiple reps. You got two reps, almost three. I think you call it 2.9, something like <laughs> <Yeah>. that. <laughs> it's pretty badass, man. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, definitely, definitely something I'm quite proud of. So when was it that I, I don't know where I saw this, but somewhere, somewhere you said that, and I have to look up the exact quote, but you said that drinking whiskey before doing deadlifts increases performance. How did you discover this cutting edge technology? <laughs> so just to, you know, the preface this, it is a real thing. So this isn't a joke. Um, but, uh, alcohol can be used as a performance enhancer. And so what got me thinking down that was, uh, you know, looking at some of the Russian lifters and some of the strength athletes are known for, you know, taking a shot of vodka before they go out and do, you know, finish up a meet, do a big heavy lift, whatever it is. And I'm like, well, there's gotta be some reason behind what they're, what they're doing here. Right. Mm. So I started doing a little bit of research on it and I did find that there's actually a pretty extensive history of alcohol use in sports, uh, dating back to the original, you know, Olympic times that that's, you know, it was, drinking wine and doing, you know, sporting events basically. Uh, and then even like there was this famous, uh, Olympic, uh, uh, marathon that was run in like the 1900 or 1901 Olympics. And it was arguably people say it was the, the toughest, uh, marathon, uh, that, uh, that was done because of the conditions. It was really hot and dusty. And the guy that won it actually like, he, he gave up and he was like going to pass out and he was revived with brandy and then went on to, and then they continued to feed him brandy. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. And, revived and, with brandy? Yes. What's and the... Brandy and strychnine actually. But anyway, <laughs> we'll stick Black to the alcohol. Magic. And uh, he, he ended up going on to win the race. And then uh, same thing in 1960s when WADA came about, uh, the very first WADA failure was for alcohol. So, which is, so that's, you know, history of drug testing in sport. It's the yeah. very first failure. Um, and, uh, it was quickly outlawed, I think in Olympic, the, uh, uh, the shooting sports. So basically where they're doing the skiing, then shooting because they would get so drunk that they were basically stumbling when they got on their <laughs> skis because, uh, alcohol is a pretty significant, uh, performance enhancer for, uh, target shooting, just the calming, right, uh, right. the calming effect that it has. Right. So anyway, I just started doing uh, research on it and I'm like, I think there's something to this. And the best analogy that I can do, you know, it, I could, I'll talk about some of the, the physiological uh, effects of it here in a second, but it's like when you're in your early twenties and you're at a bar and your friends are like, Hey, why don't you have a sh shot of liquid courage? Because it works. What does it do? It lowers your, it lowers your inhibition. Mm -hmm. It actually stops. I don't know uh, the, the the clinical name for it or any of that, but it stops the second guessing that's going on in your head. Right. You know all this, the back talk, this, the questioning yourself, all this sort of stuff. And it, if you walk over and introduce yourself at that time, you will actually perform better at the introduction. You'll be a little more outgoing. You'll be more personable. You'll be like all these things. But if you have let's say six drinks and go over there, you'll make a fool of yourself. Mm -hmm. So it's all about timing and amount. So, you know, we know it lowers inhibition and things like that, but a couple of the other things that really come into play, they're really interesting when it comes to lifting is, uh, it temporarily spikes blood pressure. Well, spike in blood pressure is going to make the weights feel lighter in your hands, right? Uh, it's nearly as energy dense as fat. So it's seven calories per, per gram, but it's, not only faster acting than carbs, it is a, the preferential energy source. So it'll move ahead of everything mm -hmm. and go straight to the cells as an energy source. And then alcohol also increases whatever mood that you're in. So you get a shot of energy, you're ready to lift, right? So we know what kind of mood you're in. It's going to enhance that as well. So in this, so basically what it comes down to is like a shot, maybe a shot and a half, whatever your individual tolerance is taken about three to five minutes before a heavy lift. Again, you wouldn't want to do this before doing a Metcon, right? Because right. it's just going to make you throw up, uh, you know, no walking over and do 50 deadlifts uh, type thing. But three to five minutes before will increase the total amount that you can lift. 
And so, so I wrote an article on this. God, it must be like four years. And I branded it whiskey and deadlifts because I'm like, well, if Russians drink vodka, what's more American than, you know, Tennessee whiskey, some yep. bourbon. Yep. And I'm like, well, if I'm going to promote it for lifting, I'll pick a, a lift like the deadlift that if something goes wrong, like – the bar falls to the ground, right? So, you know, it's not over your face. It's not on your back, any sort of that, that sort of thing. Right. And, uh, and I think people thought I was joking at first and now it's become quite the phenomenon, <laughs> like, uh, because I, it, it works without a doubt. And, uh, so, well, I wouldn't say without a doubt, I think in like the shooting sports, they've done testing and I think it's about nine out of 10 people. Mm -hmm. It's a performance enhancer for shooting. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm sure that there's some sort of similar thing where maybe it causes more inebriated effects on some people and counterbalance, right. you know, overpowers that, but, Shit, uh, nine but out of 10 is an extremely high efficacy rate. Yeah. Exactly. So, so it's really interesting because all the research on alcohol is long term. You can read on long term and short term effects, but the short term effects are still like further out than what we're talking about. This is the you know over the the couple days you know period mm -hmm. versus what we're talking about is very very. I call it near term. Like within a couple minutes of your first ingestion of, ingestion of alcohol, what happens? And uh, yeah, it's it's it. It works in that fashion. And I think it's weird things like that that I investigate and, you know, prove out that mm -hmm. that's why I got dubbed the, the mad scientist because, uh, you know, I do the same thing with equipment and biomechanics and things of that nature. Um, and it's just like the willingness to look at things and explore and uh, understand what's what's going on. That is so interesting. I'm so glad I asked that question. I thought it was going to be kind of a silly like anecdote. But you've got actual science behind this. That is awesome, yeah, and, man. And I, I've done my own testing on uh, – because I measure bar speed on everything, uh -huh. all, all my heavy lifts. And I will see a 10% increase wow. in, uh, in, in bar speed uh, when wow. – before and after a shot. So, um, and, and I've done this for years and, uh, it's, it's, you know, you can, you can directly tell the, the effect of it. Have you made any mistakes in this, uh, experimentation such as taking too many shots? Cause you, uh, obviously you're trying to find like where, where's the law of diminishing returns, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've, I've had some mistakes there. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, uh, one time I went out, uh, it was actually, I think this was in the preparation for the thousand pound deadlift cycle. Uh, cause every training day n included some whiskey mm -hmm. and, um, I, somebody brought in a bottle. So people bring in bottles to my gym when they come to visit because of, you know, because of this. And, uh, I grabbed this bottle off the shelf and I didn't notice that it was much higher proof than, uh, than everything else. Ah. I can't remember what it was, but it was, uh, basically you know, whiskey is usually, you know, like 40, 50% alcohol. This one was like, uh, uh, or yeah, this was, uh, much closer to, to a hundred. It was like 70, 70% wow. or something like that. And, uh, cause it was barrel strength. Yeah. And I grabbed this metal shot glass oh. that happened to be maybe like three shots. Oh, and, and, uh, so I'm out there doing my workout, hitting some shots and doing stuff. And next thing you know, I'm like, holy crap, I am just drunk <laughs> and I look over and I'm like half the bottle's gone and I'm like how did that happen I noticed well my shot glass is oversized and then I look at the proof and I'm like oh so anyway I had to have somebody drive me home from work that day that's hilarious <laughs> I was just like I'm trashed right <laughs> that's so, amazing I, I also happened to be in the middle of a, a divorce at the time too so right. that might have, yeah. might have had a little bit of effect on that right, uh, right. some of my choices there but oh that's so funny man so as I was preparing for this show, I, I, I almost never do this because I'm, I'm usually not interested in equipment and stuff like that, but your take on it is very, it's, it's fresh and refreshing. And I feel like I can trust you more than just about anyone else in the, in the strength sports industries. So I, I had a bunch of questions about different forms of equipment. And then I came across this blog article that you wrote that I think can kind of set a theme for this interview. And it was, it was a six month, it was something like the six month rule and shiny object syndrome. What's, what's that rule? And, and why is this important? 
Oh man, this is go on Instagram, right? And people are going to be like posting up about this greatest workout or this new cool thing that they're doing, right? Or I'm drinking this fancy coffee with whatever in it, you know, you go, the list goes on and on, right? Mm -hmm. And everybody's like, oh, this is amazing. Everybody's got to try it. And, and they've been doing it for like a week or two weeks, right? And uh, my question is, you know, check back with these people in six months and see if they're still doing it. And you'll find most of the time that they haven't. Mm -hmm. So so I make a point of never talking about anything that I'm doing, um, which means not posting some of my stuff because people will always ask me questions unless it's something that's made it past the six month rule. So where it has become I've realized the validity of its importance and I've added it to my routine or subtracted something else to make it part of my, you know, my, my, my discipline daily, you know, workout week, whatever, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it's just, it's a natural human tendency to get fascinated with the new exciting thing. Right. And you want to share it with everybody else. But that doesn't mean that it really has that long-term validity to mix into your training, rehab, lifestyle, whatever it is. And if it doesn't prove the test of time, and I just arbitrarily picked the six months, um, but I think that's an adequate period of time, uh, that if it, it's still not part of your routine at that time, you know, it, it's not worth it. So right. don't be, don't be out there trying to promote and push these things. And we see it happening all the time. Right. And so people are constantly this new product, this new toy. And this is coming from somebody that I have a company that creates new products and new toys. Right. Um, and honestly, there's several of our products. I'll tell you that I don't want you to use we make them because we know that on occasion we have to, right. but if you were doing things right to begin with, you wouldn't have to use this tool. So your goal should be not to use the tool that I sell. Right. And I, we're probably one of the few companies that will tell you that <laughs> and try to help you on the path to, to not doing that through our education as well. Oh, that's great, man. Yeah. It really it jumped out at me because like the, the word six month rule, because I have a six month rule with any tattoos. If I have an idea and I still like it in six months, then, then maybe I'll actually consider getting it. But I never, I never do impulsive ones because it's going to be, it's it's, be on me forever. This is, this is exactly the, that's exactly the same thought. And how many times does it, has it happened where you've had this like idea and you're infatuated with yep. it and you're like, I just want to go get it now. And do you still want to? Right. And a most of them dozen. Yeah. probably, right. Yeah. D just disappear over time. You're like, ah, okay. I moved on. Yep. I do. A, I do a thing with books these days too. I, cause I found myself always wanting to read the new books. And then so I, I maybe it was Ryan holiday or someone that said something like, you know, they brought up shiny object syndrome and the fact that we always want the, the, the new thing, but it's a way safer bet to get a book that came out 20 years ago and is still super popular mm, yes. than just getting something that has 500 reviews on Amazon in the past three months. And so I've started to pick up a lot of older books that are still really popular and it's worked out really, really well for me. Excellent. But speaking of new books, I mean, Ryan Holiday is a, uh, a more prevalent recent author. He does some good stuff. Let me tell yeah, you. He does. He does. The, it's, yeah, not a black, it's not black and white. Yeah. The obstacle is the way is uh, one of his, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Love that one. Phenomenal book. So that kind of sets us up for, I've got a few kind of common shiny objects that I see in the industry. And I want your take on whether they pass the six month rule or not. And the first okay. is I see a lot of beginner to intermediate lifters, especially in the CrossFit space doing r super high volume programs like squat programs, such as, uh, the Smolov. I think it's like six days a week squatting. Yep. Very, very I'm, high volume. I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with the, the old small off, small up junior. And yeah. <laughs> so what, what, what's your take on this and, and how does it affect to, um, how does it relate to the principle of minimum effective dose? Is, is this crazy or, um, 
or, or so is there some efficacy? It, 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 is, it is crazy. Uh, so you have to build tolerance, right? Uh, that is what strength training is about. So it's building tolerance to load. It's building tolerance to volume. It's building tolerance to frequency, right? So we want to progressively work that. So those programs are based off of lifters like, oh, here's this famous lifter that set this bench press, you know, world record or whatever it was. He'd been coached for 20 years by Boroshiko leading up to being able to do that. Mm -hmm. And now you're going to jump in and try to squat every day uh, starting out. It, 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 this is – you've got to have – to be able to accomplish that, you have to have – you can only do it if you're a highly qualified athlete with – good movement patterns consistently over time, right? Mm -hmm. So you, we definitely don't want to throw in people and that's part of it. So anytime that you're evaluating uh, a pro, you know, somebody's like looking at a, a program that they want to do, the first question you should ask is what is the program I just did? And then now how do I build on that? How do I add some more frequency to that? If I've been squatting twice a week, okay, how do I move to squatting two and a half days a week? Or how do I move to squatting three days every – three times every nine days, right? Um, still, that's an increase, right? And how do – you know, because you don't want to just jump, oh, now I'm going to – I see Duffin was squatting every day. I, that didn't happen, right. you know, just like that. Um, you know, my deadlifting, I was deadlifting every other day uh, leading into this last uh, training cycle. That took three years to move from deadlifting weekly to deadlifting, you know, three to four times a week, three years of progression. So this isn't something that you do, you know, just on a whim that I'm going to increase. I see this program that does this. And so it, now if we throw a, a, a newer lifter in there that has uh, movement variability, a lot of variability in their technique, um, you're going to just compound issues because you're not going to have any time to recover or address the things that come up. So as soon as you get some deviation, it's just going to build upon itself. And we see this over, imagine trying to getting a little bit of hip shift going into a, a 30 day daily squat program. What's going to happen by the end of it? You're going to have ha massive compensation patterns built in mm -hmm. and not really have done anything uh, you know, fantastic for yourself because all you needed to do was actually add a couple sets a week. So what's, right? what's the, what is the long-term advantage of progressing more slowly? Uh, the long-term, well, <laughs> not to beat, beat yourself into the ground. We, you know, this is, this sport isn't NASCAR. It doesn't happen at 200 miles an hour. So I've been training for about 30 years. And so if you think that you can run, you know, ramp it from that fast, how, what are you going to do the next session after that or the next mm -hmm. training log after that? Right. We have to be able to progress this. So you don't need to jump that far to make gains. What we need to do is at, so the more loading that we can get into in a, in a, in a, in a certain time block, let's say here's a month time frame. Uh, how many sets above, you know, 90%, you know, can, you know, reps am I going to be able to accumulate? So, you know, to make progress, I need to increase that from next month, you know, from this month to next month and then that month to the, the following month. Right. So if I try to take what would take me, you know, 10 years to develop and, and push it in there, one, I'm going to substantially increase my injury risk. But, you know, if we're talking to new lifters, they don't believe they can get injured. So we'll disregard that. But now what do you do next? <laughs> Where do you, how do you progress that to another level? Yeah. Right. Um, so you only need to do, it's building yourself is, is training is simple. It's a balance between how much load can I add and get, uh, uh you know, a dose response from that training and still maximize the amount of recovery time that I have so that I can actually, you know, build, actually build and grow from that. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so if I'm minimizing the other half, because all I'm focused on is one part of the equation, you're not going to, you know, you, you know, one plus a negative one still equals zero. So it just doesn't, you, you, you've got no long-term approach to training here. You're sacrificing probably what you could accomplish in that short period of time and significantly increasing your injury risk. We have to build upon what, what we've accumulated so far as, you know, in our training. Mm -hmm. 
Like, and don't. where are we at? Where are we at? And now, okay, how do I go from there? Like, it's not like, what's the best program out there? There is no such thing. Right. There is what's the best next step from where I'm at now. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And don't look, don't try to pick out the one person you've seen something like small of work for long term. Try to take a, a bird's eye view and, and notice that the vast majority of people doing programs like this are getting injured, right? Or they're getting overtrained and they're getting burnt out on. Yeah. Sport. People always want to look at the outlier, go like, well, this famous person does this thing different than right. every, everybody else. So that's the one thing that must be And like, no, don't look at it that way. Look at amongst all the great lifters in this field. What are the common things that I find amongst them, not what are the differentiating things, right? What are the common things that I find? And that's where, that's where you want to go. And it's an opposite way of most people. Cause they're always looking for that, that magic pill, that secret pathway, that one thing that's different, that's going to get them there. No, we want to find what are the most common things that allows people to be successful? What is the consistently working, right? The next one is things like steel maces. And I think you guys have a product called shoulder rocks. Yep. And I I've, I've messed around with these a uh, handful of times and, and enjoyed them. And I've had, you know, good, what I would call kind of active recovery workouts. And with that mm -hmm. said, I, I knew little to nothing about what was actually going on in the shoulders while I was doing these exercises. And I didn't see much efficacy in them. Uh, fast forward to pr preparing for this interview, I came across a, I think a, a testimonial of one of your clients, like someone that had bought one of your shoulder rocks that said, basically doctors were telling him his shoulder was just torn apart and he needed surgery, et cetera, et cetera. And he picked up one of these shoulder rocks and did it religiously. And it basically completely healed it. So I'm wondering what, what are these things actually good for yeah, and, and what are they not and, good for? Yeah. And that's, that's not an outlier testimonial. If you, anybody goes on our product page and just reads the testimonials, they're unfiltered, unedited. Every review is on there and you'll see massive amounts of pe people over people avoiding surgeries, um, for things that, you know, that looks like it's the only solution for all sorts of shoulder type issues. Um, and uh, I'm going to explain why that works, but also why probably most people swinging the way maces these days are not getting that effect. And it comes down to, uh, well, Muhammad Ali knew it. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. What, what do you hear in that phrase? It's all about the balance of speed to relaxation and speed to contraction. They're highly related and everybody wants to focus on speed to contraction, but you can't, how fast you relax is also tied to the other. So, and this is actually true athleticism. We can't be tight and all the time. We can't be on all the time. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when we start developing, uh, you know, issues, restrictions around, you know, hips, shoulders, we start losing mobility, uh, the scaps not moving, right. All this sort of stuff. It happens because the wrong muscles are trying to stabilize the joint because the right muscles that are supposed to stabilize it are, are not doing their, their job for whatever reason. And there's a lot of different patterns that come into play to make that happen. And, uh, so the getting back to the float like a butterfly, sting like a bee, we have to have contraction and relaxation cycles. So if you take a kettlebell and go over your head and do a very similar movement called a, uh, a halo, you will not get the same effects because why in, a, in that movement, you're on all the time. Right. right. So you're always but now. Attention. Yes. So now if we put a weight on a very long lever. To actually complete the swing, you must, you must relax fully at the right time. And then you must contract all the muscles that stabilize that entire shoulder girdle in the right order and sequence all at once and then turn them back off again. What are we doing here? That's like if you do it appropriately, that's basically a play on de developmental kinesiology. So we're going back to base function and turning the muscles on and off in the right patterns. All the muscles are around and supporting that shoulder girdle. So now we're actually doing a neurological reset while we're doing a strength training or warm up move. And so this is the problem that most people have is they're 
there's a most most of the mesas out there are too short. Um, so the mace has been around. It's the longest. So talk about the six month rule. The mace is the longest running weighted strength training implement that I'm aware of. It goes back over 400 years, arguably longer than that. I'm hooked. I'm hooked now. So, so the reason it's been around, it freaking works. <laughs> and, but all the classical maces are uh, a certain length, which is about 46 to 49 inches in length. Um, so if you go grab a sledgehammer at 30 inches or some of the other maces on the market at 30 to 36 inches, you do not get that same neurological reset happening. The movement looks very similar. It is not the same. So is it better than nothing? Yes. Is it the same thing? No. So make sure that you have something the right length. You can have a shoulder rock. You can make your own. You can do find somebody else that makes one. I don't care. But make sure it's in the 46 to 49 inch length. What? The problem is when you get it that long, a very small change in weight makes a very big difference. Mm -hmm. And that's why people are making the shorter maces because they don't want to tell you, um, you know, if you get a long one, you're going to need like, you know, eight different maces. And right. that's why we made ours micro loadable so that it's long, it's the right length, and you can just use your standard gym plates on it to change the weight because you'd have to you have to do that as you progress in very small increments, you know, a certain weight for one lifter is going to be very different for another, another lifter to make that happen. So anyway, the, the base of this, we're, we, we are moving the shoulder through its entire range of motion, right? And we're, we're pulsing all the muscles on that stabilize and, and support that shoulder girdle appropriately, boom, 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 on and off. So in a two to three week period of time of doing this, like three days a week, you'll have substantial increase. And in, I, I just call it shoulder health because if your shoulders are tight, you're going to gain mobility. If you've got sloppy shoulders, like it, you know, comes out of socket shifts, you know, you have trouble stabilizing, it's going to stiffen, right? If you've got an impingement, a lot of times that'll disappear because now we've created more space in the shoulder. So all these sorts of things that like seem to be a structural, we can't change it start changing. If we've actually got more space in that capsule, it's functioning better. All the muscles supporting it are working better. Like what type of shoulder issue is it not going to help? Right. And that sounds stupid. Like, uh, he's saying it's a fix all. Well, it kind of is like, I have not yet found any type of shoulder issue that it's not able to help. And so is it going to fix everybody's shoulder? No. It's not. So they, 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 I'm not making that claim whatsoever right. at I all. I mean, if you've got a full but, labrum tear and your, your <laughs> yeah. bone is hanging off. It, exactly. You, but you, we've, had people that, with, we've had people with labrum tears, AC joint issues, impingements. Like it, The list goes on and on and on. Is it going to help every one of them? No. It depends on the severity and what's going on mm -hmm. uh, with the issue. But it, just get online and do some research and you will find that we have a cult following on this because that product has changed people's lives. Um, I've got a, I just saw yesterday on Instagram, there's a lifter that, uh, tagged it and he has a, gen, uh, a deformity from birth in his right shoulder and he's in his twenties. It looks like he's swinging the shoulder rock and has now is his scap is actually moving for the first time in his life and his shoulders getting healthier is hitting PRs. Um, and you know, that's crazy. Like this guy's had this problem since birth in the shoulder rock is improving his functioning. Wow. So, Super cool. so anyway, it's just like, make sure you do it properly. The other thing is like, I, I love Indian clubs. I think there's a time and place for it. If you, if you, but with a lot of our ath strength athletes, they become ineffective for the same reason, that little two pound weight, you know, out there in your hand, a lot of the guys that are strong enough, they won't uh, they, they never actually relax when they're swinging it. Right. So same thing. So you've got to have that. And same thing. People want to learn to swing with like, Oh, I want to use it with no weight so I can learn to do it. Well, you can't cause you actually have to have enough weight on there to teach you to relax. So like when I work with like, um, I did the re, uh, rehab recovery for both, uh, Eric Spoto, who's a world, uh, uh, he was the raw bench press, uh, champion of the world, had a rotator cuff, uh, uh, tear and surgery. Um, I did, uh, Ryan Canelli, who was the best geared bench presser in the world. And both those guys, like I had to start with, uh, a, a, a pretty heavy weight cause they're, you know, over 300 pounds, you know, Ryan walks around over 300 with, you know, abs showing, um, to actually get him to open up and be able to relax. He's got to have a pretty significant weight on there. So one of my guys was working with him all day and they're like, I can't get anywhere cause I was out and I came in and I'm like, uh, put some weight on there, more right. weight. 
He's like, I can't. I haven't got the next one. Put it on there. He swings it. Swings perfectly um, because you, you've just got to have have that to balance the musculature of the individual. So it's just a little bit counterintuitive. And um, the big thing, yeah, we're doing – so appro- So your question was how do we use it? So this is not like your primary strength training tool. This is not going to replace – you know, if you're an overhead athlete, you need to be doing some overhead pressing. If you're a power lifter, you got to be bench pressing. That's going to develop some, some great strength about the shoulder for all those movements. It's not going to do that. It's going to probably potentiate your more strength for you if it's working better and healthier. So the best approach is for me either pre-training, post-training, or on an off day. Uh, three sets of like 10 reps. Um, you're just going to feel way better. Um, if the shoulders are moving better, you're going to, your spine's going to be in a better position because you're not going to be, you know, getting out of position, trying to, you know, get that shoulder in position. Um, so it, it's a great warm up tool. So in a matter of like less than like three minutes, you can be primed your blood, you know, your, you'll be a little sweaty, your heart rate will be up. You'll feel your shoulders will feel healthy and you'll feel ready to train. So that's an incredibly economical thing because I could do the same thing by trying to foam roll for 20 minutes and then do some, you know, a bunch of different exercise. Next thing you know, you're over a half hour in and you feel like taking a nap because you've just <laughs> been, you know, you're rolling around, not actually getting prepped for training. Right. What's your, um, what's your preferred but, resource for learning techniques in, in the way that you're explaining the, the contract, relax techniques? So, um, well, uh, I have a, uh, I have a, a video. So every shoulder rock that's sold, um, you get a link to the private uh, coaching video, uh, which is based on, and some of the cueing in it is based on, uh, from a dynamic neuromuscular stabilization. So it's a, uh, developmental uh, kinesiology approach out of, uh, out of Prague. And so I use that philosophy in, in creating the coaching uh, for the use of the product and also how to progress it. Cause you just don't want to take a big weight like that and throw it behind your shoulder. If you've got a, you know, a labrum tear or rotator, you know, like right. you just don't do that. So there is a progression to it. Uh, you start in front and you kind of let it learn to swing it back and forth, just hanging from your hand mm-hmm. with basically no activation of the wrist, just a pulsing method. Then you put it behind your head and you start learning the same thing, getting it as close to your body and as deep behind you as you can and start pulling it up. And then we work to a, the pullover position where you're pulling it over the shoulder into the front position. And then we start learning the drop back finally, which is the, how to drop it into the swing, the relax before you contract back into the pull up. Uh, a little hard to explain verbally. Um, but, uh, yeah, we, we have a video that, you know, we, we, we send with, uh, with all of them to help people. And I've got tons of videos online of swinging if people want to try to figure it out themselves too. So just not the very specific, uh, uh, walkthrough, um, on the coaching prog- pr- progression. All right. You got me. I'm buying one. I'm buying <laughs> one, Chris. Love uh, it, dude. You, you'll, you'll be happy. I mean, it is, it's, it is a game changer for people, especially, you know, us, you know, strength athletes, especially CrossFit, powerlifting, like absolutely instrumental with the amount of overhead work and stuff that, uh, that you guys do in CrossFit. So yeah, big, 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 uh, big proponent and, uh, I'll get you sorted out. All right. Sounds great, dude. I've gotten super into jujitsu. I'm training six days a week right now and my thoracic and my shoulders are just getting thrashed. So that sounds like exactly what I need right now, man. Yeah. So you could do it post, you could do it as a, you, you could try that as a, a warm up before your sessions, uh-huh. or you could try it as a, uh, so here's the, the other ones is do it post session to mitigate any damage that you did right. or like I keep one out the back door of my house. So on my off day, I, you know, if I'm barbecuing dinner, I can walk out, hit a few swings in. Um, so it's really incredibly versatile how you, mm-hmm. you, you fit it in. You're going to get a great benefit either way. So find uh, the one that gives you the best results and, and run with it. Yeah. This has got morning routine all over it. Absolutely. My next one is breathing mass. And I, I'll say this, I've, I've always thought intuitively that they are bullshit, and that is a completely ignorant stance because I have no idea what's actually going on. Um, maybe I'm just thinking that because I don't understand them. What, what is your take on them? 
So I'm not entirely educated at the moment. I like to uh, research things and then I file away decisions is how my head works. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Unless it's something I have to uh, explain to people all the time, like shoulder rock or stuff like that. Right. And I will have my dissertations readily at hand. But uh, uh, my understanding, and this is also based on uh, feedback I've gotten from a number of uh, clinical professionals that I work with. Is that and I so I, I believe that there is research validating this opinion, okay. um, but I, I can't reference anybody here. So this is it's almost the same as yours It's an uneducated opinion. But this is my opinion based off of the circles that I walk in and uh, and in the knowledge that I have. It's crap. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. So <laughs> and that's kind of what it, I've heard yeah. as well. Yeah, it's just not I mean, it's not doing the concept of what they're what they're thinking and, uh, you, you know, making the diaphragm work harder to uh, to, you know, to breathe is not really going to do a whole lot for, you know. Yeah, it's just not doing what the, its intended purpose. Right. And it's just goofy. I, I want to be proven wrong so badly because the. A, they look badass. They and do. They, and I love, I, I, you know, conditioning is my strength. And so if I, if I found some way to get an even greater advantage conditioning wise, I would be all over that. I just, from what I've heard and, and from the explanations I've heard people give, it just doesn't seem like it's going to really move the needle if do anything at all. No. Now the, the chambers that you can go in that have low oxygen, yeah. uh, and the training centers that have those, that can be really, the, uh, the hyperbarics. Uh, Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I think that was the, what people were thinking that a mask uh, would do. Yeah. And it does, it doesn't do that. So hyperbaric tra training that works. Very, yeah. Very validated. But the uh, mask does not do the same thing. Right. What's the number one piece of equipment people aren't using that they should be in your opinion? Um, I think it's uh, specialty barbells. So we continue as an industry just to, to gravitate to a straight bar because straight bars have been around forever. And I just don't think it's the best choice unless you are a barbell sport athlete. And even if you are, there's times that relieving some of the stresses because a straight barbell doesn't put you in some of the great joint positions to lift in. Uh, when you're pressing, you're fighting um, – you're fighting to maintain that external rotation of the shoulder. The bar is going to keep forcing you unnaturally into an overly internally rotated position. Right. Same thing while squatting. We've got excessive pressure on the bicep tendon uh, insertion into the shoulder. Uh, the stresses on the shoulder mobility uh, drive itself into the spine. So we end up with uh, excessive disc issues uh, from people hyperextending, trying to uh, trying to get into position to squat. It's just a remnant of what it's been. You know, the only thing I ever, well, I use a straight bar for deadlifting with and uh, and some rowing. But other than that, I'm using a specialty bar for most everything that I do. And I, I just, and, and particularly, so, you know, and for a power lifter or a CrossFit athlete, maybe a little less so, right? Because you're at the end of the day, you're a barbell sport yeah, athlete. You're being and, tested with right? those implements. So, yeah. so you've got to use those. But like I have athletes that, you know, 900 pound squatters that show up. And the only time that the, since they've used a straight bar last is the last meet that they've done because they're a 50 year old athlete. They just like cumulatively, they can't train. Right. And so they can go do it. But if they do it every week, it's going to destroy them. Right. Uh, my, myself during my competitive career and Donnie Thompson, who was Mr. 3000, first person to break the 3000 terror barrier. Both of us actually found we had the same philosophy, which was to use, um, well, uh, the Duffalo bar that 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 we produce um, year round up to three to four weeks out from competition, you get a couple squats in with a straight bar and then go into the competition. And so we'd cumulatively reduce the total stress on our system in a negative, the, the negative stressors, right? So that we're just focused on those others. And then, but my pet peeve is like all these athletes in the collegiate and professional sport, like all these sports that are not barbell sport athletes. And we continue to just beat people up right. with these you know, with this, you know, antiquated bar that's just been around forever because that's what it is and that's what they've done. And we want to, you know, it's kind of the opposite of the shiny object syndrome. It's coaches that, uh, you know, are too far the other perspective, like, you know, just 
going to do what I've done for the last, you know, 50 years and just keep doing it and not, not look to anything like, can things be better? Right. Oh, very, hell yeah. They can be, man. I, they I've can be a lot better perspective. And it just, it, 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 hit, it hits like just truth does, you know, um, it just sounds like obviously there, there must be a better way than the thing, the first, the first way we've learned to do it. Right. And, and, and those came out because they were easiest, right. It was easier to just create something straight. Yep. And just like, uh, my transformer bar, it's the, it's the first and only bar like it in the world, but we can actually change the loading about the hip joint, um, which completely changes spinal mechanics. And so we can actually now make a bar do like all these things that, you know, I could make it more posterior chain dominant, more, more quad dominant. Um, I can change the range of motion that you could actually lift in because I can actually move the load in front of your shoulder. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, I actually haven't moved the sh load in front of your shoulder. What I've done is the load is actually still stays above your midfoot at all times. So if you disposition that load, you're actually put, pu pushing the spine behind you, allowing more spinal upriding, right? So which is going to cue more core engagement. It's going to improve spinal position, which is then going to have an effect on the hips, the knees, everything through the chain. I've gone into multiple colleges where, you know, I'll go to demonstrate and they'll give me their off the, off the squatting list. So here's my five or six guys that aren't allowed to squat because they're recovering from injury. They've got poor squat mechanics, whatever. And, uh, I'll just put the bar on the rack and I'll start adjusting and having them squat through it. And the coaches will just be like jaws on the floor drooling because they'll have gone from like a, a knees valgus squat, six inches high, uh, excess, you know, arched, arch to hell, uh, or, and then rounding as they get to the bottom to perfectly executed squats with zero coaching. Wow. All by just changing where the load is sitting in relation to that joint. And it sounds uh, complicated, but I started to explain it like this. Like we all know we're teaching somebody to squat and they're having trouble. What do we do? We put a, we put a kettlebell in their hands and have them do a goblet squat. Mm -hmm. What have we just done? Oh, we've just put the load in front of them, allowing more spinal upright and more core activation. We changed the pattern. But the only problem is you can't load that. Right, right. <laughs> Your front delts are going to fail. Um, so now we can, we can change that. I can mimic a, I can mimic a front squat. I can mimic a, uh, a goblet squat. I can mimic a goblet squat further away. I can mimic a low bar squat, uh, like all these 20, there's 24 different variations of, of load settings. Um, but those are the things like nobody's really thinking about like that until they see it. And they're like, Oh my God, that is a fucking game changer. Right. That and, uh, yeah. Just like, uh, uh, worked with Reese Hoffa. He was, uh, uh, went to the Olympics for the shot put, uh, through four Olympic cycles and his fourth Olympic cycle, he's getting older and beat up. Right. And he didn't think he was going to do it, but he started, uh, benching and squatting with the Duffalo bar and swinging the shoulder rock. And he says, that was the game. That's the, that, and that is the thing that got him, uh, through that Olympic cycle, it wow. was a complete game changer for him as far as his training and shoulder health. Wow. So you're, you know, one of the best discus thrower or uh, shot putters around. I've actually, right. I've got, I've got another one I'm training right now. Uh, we'll see how he does at the next Olympics. So That's super cool, man. What's the number one piece of equipment people, you think people are overusing or even shouldn't be using at all? Foam roller or even our soft tissue tools. So, Interesting. Interesting. so yeah, so there's times that you're going to have to use them, but I, I think people misplace it as a thing that they have to do. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I've got to mobilize, I got to balance my mobility with my strength training. And so they end up going in and they're rolling around for 30 to 45 minutes doing this random movement, that random movement and missing the fact that, Hey, if you've got a foam roll, your IT band every time before you squat for the last two years. You don't have an IT band problem. You have a squat problem, right? You need to go fix that. And so you, you, things aren't just automatically tightening up. Like they're tightening up because we're, we're not lifting well. 
Okay. The body's trying to protect that joint by tightening the muscles around it. So we need to get back to, to doing that and being very, very also specific. And this is kind of like a scope creep discussion, right? Cause everybody reads, Oh, this, this mobility exercise, this rolling procedure, this soft tissue on this air. And they end up with this massive list of stuff that they mm-hmm. just kind of half ass through. And I'm like, no, pick like the top three issues that you've got and fix them in the next couple months, nail them and now move on to some other issues. Mm -hmm. So if you continue to treat the same areas in the same fashion over and over again, and you're never not getting to, to doing it, the goal should actually be that you walk into your training session. And the first thing that you do is warm up. That's right. Put weight on the bar and actually start doing progressions to warm up. We forget warming up as a warm up, right? But if if we're moving well, we shouldn't th- – this is all what I call triage work. Now, if your quads are hurting, yeah, you're going to have to do some work. Or, hey, I can't get in position uh, you know, uh, with a bar on my back. I need to work on mobilizing my shoulders. Like, yeah, We've got to get joints in position uh, to be able to perform a lift, right? If I can't get into an overhead position and I'm supposed to be doing overhead work today – Guess what? We got to, we got to, we got to clean that up, Mm -hmm. but you should, if if you're having to do that over and over and over again, you're not addressing the root cause goal should not to be using that. So that's like one of the tools that I, I, we sell. It's probably our highest volume stuff is our soft tissue treatment tools. And yeah, you should have them around and have it for use, but it shouldn't be something that you rely on. And if you have to use it, figure out why and figure out how to stop using it. Yeah, I really, really appreciate that approach. I was I was curious to see how you would, because I'm going to ask you about your the, the soft tissue stuff that y'all use, and I was curious to see how you would approach that because you have such a holistic approach to strength training and performance in general, and I've always thought that those implements are they're band-aids for a lot of people, right? And they and people yep. become really reliant on them. So I appreciate you taking that approach despite y- you guys selling them. Um, do you ever- We sell them, but we provide the education, like go to one of our seminars and we'll teach you, like this is the last, very last route that mm-hmm. we go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, With yeah. for people that have a, a serious mobility issue and, you know, maybe they are that person that has- they've had the same exact warm up routine for a year and it takes them 30 45 minutes just to even get loose and they've identified that they have a serious problem do you ever recommend people take like almost completely take some time off from training heavy so that they can actually make some improvements in mobility and overall health rather than just continuing to train through it and continuing to tear up muscle tissue and keep everything's tight so uh, two things. No, I do not ever have them take time completely off, but I also never have them continue to push through pain. Never. We never push. We may touch on the edges of pain. Um, so what you need to do there is yes, we've got to be able to have a joint in a position to do a lift. If you can't, Maybe we need to modify the movement while we're – or pick different movements while we're trying to, 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 to redo that. And then once we've actually made changes to the tissue, we want to go train within those ranges to tell the body that it's safe. So if I take time completely off and I just get massage work done and chiro work done and whatever, like those gains are going to disappear. And the science over and over – tells us that the soft tissue work that happens is really incredibly temporary temporary, uh, and is not doing any long-term change. But what does do long-term change Mm -hmm. is actually loading because load allows the body to have an adaptive response to it. We're stressing the body and we're going to have an adaptive response. So that's why we don't want to get away from it. So so it, you know, like let's say take something simple. If I'm not able to get into an overhead position, All right. And I'm an overhead athlete. Um, so I might do some soft tissue work on a, on an off day and then follow it up with some walking in the overhead position, uh, walking with a, uh, a kettlebell in a rack position overhead. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now I'm loading it, telling the body it's safe to play in that range, but then maybe on my training days, I'm going to pick some variations. Maybe I can do overhead presses, uh, off of a pin. 
you know, seated, trying to maintain. I'm going to pick some exercises that I can still train and do those things that are going to carry over to, to, um, to that lift or that movement that I'm trying to, to do that I can't. So it's, it's just a matter of, uh, well, that's, you know, lateralizing training. Right. And, uh, but rarely do we want to move to regressions, right? So we don't want to go, Hey, I can't train. I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to do this body weight drills, particularly if we've got an athlete because we're actually detraining. Right. So training and movement is the, is the, is what starts the healing response. Um, mitochondria level, cellular level, like all these, like, uh, neurologically, hormonally, like all these systems are actually kicked on through the training system. So if we take an athlete and we go, ah, you're injured, we're pulling you. We've, act, we're actually detraining them. We're putting them in. What happens when we don't train? We atrophy. Mm -hmm. Atrophy is not a great process for making progress or healing the issue. Right. Um, so now if we've got acute inflammation or post, uh, post surgery type stuff, we're going to manage that very closely and maybe a little bit differently until we get through those very acute, uh, you know, you know, inflammation phases, but we're still going to actually be doing light movements and loading multiple times a day. So I've, I've done this, uh, post surgery or post like very significant injuries multiple times, many, many times. And I've been back and people are constantly, you know, questioning, how did, how did, how did you just do that? You know, you tore a hamstring and, you know, three weeks, three weeks later, you're deadlifting 900 pounds. Um, you know, I detached a couple, uh, heads from my pec a number of years ago, had surgery on that. You know, the surgeon says, ah, you know, you're not going to be able to, uh, to train heavy for 12 months. And after that, you'll never be as strong as you were before. Well, I competed at nine months and set the fourth highest all time total wow. at that meet. So obviously I was training heavy before nine months. Right. Mm -hmm. And this is with two heads of my pec, you know, with completely detached with three studs, putting them back on my arm. And I've been stronger since then than before. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, it's really closely monitoring, um, you know, the processes as you're doing that. So again, we never, so, you know, rules of thumb, never move into pain. You can skirt the edges of pain so that you, and, and try to push it a little bit further each time, um, so that you know that you're making progress and we're kind of sending a little bit of a, of a signal there, but we never move into pain. We want to be able to get a joint in a position to be able to train. If not, we will need to change the movement or movement selection, uh, to accommodate that while we work through trying to, to improve the, the, the whatever area it is that we need to, uh, to address. Right. I, I've been very into, <clears throat> I think just mobility work in general and, and the science behind it. And I, nowhere in sport are we able to say this is the only way, or this is the best way. But one thing that I'm noticing come up more and more over the past three or four years is this notion of creating space and then kind of cementing that, that new movement pattern, right? You create, you create mm -hmm. uh, a new range of motion and then go and, uh, go and reinforce it through load, as you're saying. Yep. And frequency. And it doesn't, the loading has, doesn't have to be. So when you're learning new muscle patterns or in a recovery phase, I'm all about like very, very high frequency. People don't realize like when I'm, when I'm injured, my discipline and frequency goes through the roof because I, I may be doing work on that, that area four times a day. Mm -hmm. Now there may be five to eight minute sessions of, you know, basically a mini band or body weight type stuff. Uh, but you know, I'm working on perfecting, you know, in working through those ranges, working through those ranges with as close to perfect technique. So really focusing on the intent of what I'm doing, not going through the motions, right? Cause we want to prime the system, not just the, you know, the muscles moving through the range, but neurologically like getting everything firing and coordinating and moving well together. So spinal position, bracing, all this stuff needs to be nailed as you're doing this stuff, but it really stimulates the healing process and really ingraining, uh, those motor patterns. And What's your kind of, kind of the, 
yeah, along with this, what's your take on functional range conditioning? And if, uh, if you're super familiar with it, maybe just give people a little bit of background. Okay. So, uh, FRC, I haven't attended a course, so I can't speak too much, uh, uh, about that, but I do know, uh, that's, uh, Andrew Spina and, uh, Dewey Nielsen, right? Yep. Um, so I have literally in the circles that I work in, like have never heard anything but positive, uh, about either of those gentlemen and their work. Um, but I, you know, I've also reached out to, uh, you know, whether, Hey, I should, should I, should I be taking some of these courses and picking up what they're, what they're learning from some of the people in the clinical side? And the response is, you know, I, I really don't need to do that based on the work that, that I'm already doing. So I don't really have a whole lot to, to speak on there. Um, you know, I can't give you a, you know, a nice concise, this is what they're doing, or mm-hmm. this is my belief on that one way or another. Um, but, uh, my understanding is it seems to be pretty solid. Um, I just, uh, anytime you're getting into any of these specialty disciplines, I just warn people of not going too far down the rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. We don't want to forget that at the end of the day, we're, we're athletes and we're responding to stressing our bodies. And so we can really kind of get way too far off these pathways and we need to figure out how everything that you're doing is going to tie back into my training. Right. Right. How do I, how do I add more load, add more frequency of that load during, during given windows and, uh, and be in the positions that I need to be in. So if I'm already able to access all the positions that I need to be in with my joints, uh, while I perform my movements, do I need to do more? Not necessarily. So, um, because at doing, you know, at accessing more range of motion for an area that you're not actually using, isn't really adding any value and consuming some resources that you could be putting towards training. Mm-hmm. Now, if you're an athlete for a living and you have nothing but time to focus on training and, you know, mobility and all that stuff, that's a whole different discussion as well. But most of the people in the world have job, you know, family, friends, all this other stuff. And you've got, here's my allotted time per day, per week that I can mix into this stuff. So my, 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 that's my only hesitation, you know, the tempering and that's with anything, even the stuff that, uh, the philosophies that I, I pull heavily from is don't go down the rabbit hole and get too lost where you're doing <laughs> all this work and you've actually pulled back on your training, right? Cause training is your adaptive stress. You need, as long as you can get in positions to be able to load and do it effectively and move well, that's what you need to do. So if you need to add that to your toolbox to, uh, to accomplish that, then do so. And, uh, like I said, uh, both those gentlemen heard nothing but, uh, great things about their work. Yeah. Likewise, man, I'm, I'm, I've been curious for long enough. I need, I just needed to hop in one of those seminars Anyway, I've got a couple more questions for you and then we'll get out of here. Um, I've never, not never, I haven't seen a lot of coaches or athletes in the CrossFit space that really have any idea what to do after a hamstring tear. Mm. And I think, I think it's a really, it's a, it's a tough challenge for a lot of athletes in any sport, but especially in this sport. Uh, which is just a lot of new coaches. And so I'm, I'm, I want to pick your brain. What, what's, what are you guys doing with tam, uh, hamstring tears? How do you think about it? Uh, how are you getting people to recover? Okay. A uh, bit of a sore subject right now. Cause I just got my MRI results from, uh, oh, no. that, that injury I sustained when I was pulling, uh, 400 kilo every day for over two weeks. Uh, and, uh, anyway, I detached, uh, uh, the semitendinosis, uh, uh, from the distal end. So anyway, (laughs) so I got to work through it myself. I'm not concerned. I've been through this before. So, um, and coached a lot of people through this. So to the question, um, uh, a lot of people want to focus on too specifically on the hamstring and we need to understand that as a, it's an involved system. And so I definitely am going to start with, you know, Definitely you know, function about the hip is incredibly important. Function about the hip is directly related to spinal mechanics. Okay. So, so we've got to, and, and as well as the foot. So those are the two areas that we've got to make sure that we're really addressing that we've got good foot mechanics and we've got great spinal mechanics and bracing and control of pelvis position. Okay. And then once you've got that, 
now we want to look at starting to balance those muscles uh, uh, about that hip and how they're how they're firing and working. Okay, so um, the the actual recovery from the injury is going to be a little bit differently based on which hamstring we have a problem with, right? Um, but I have. I've found a lot of uh, power in actually cueing of uh, adductors uh, in combination with the glutes mm -hmm. and so in controlling that hip function and, 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 and specifically there's research around uh, it's the Copenhagen adduction drill um, uh, which is a adductor specific movement. Well, it's adductor but it's a whole chain. So we're actually working from the foot through the oblique sling up to a stabilized shoulder. It's a, a side a side plank uh, balanced off of one hip. And then you lower the hip and open the adductor as well. I think yeah, uh, I think at I've the same time you using that with yeah. some athletes. So there's numerous research uh, showing that that drill in particular reduces hamstring tears and strains in the field if it done prior to practice. So, uh, so just to validate my opinion, there is research on that. Um, so find movements like that that would be incredibly powerful. So I like a couple movements. So there's a lot of ways. You know, we, we just want to walk through that whole rehab discussion we just had. You would do that particularly with your choices of hamstring movements and stuff like that. I've got an article actually on this on hamstring. So it, if you want to like walk through some of the exercises and how I'd employ them and all that, uh, just type in Google Chris Duff and hamstring, uh, uh, recovery should pop up. But, uh, here's two movements that are my favorite for assessing, uh, whether you're returned to play. And again, it's work, looking at it from a more systematic approach than just testing that hamstring and going, is it, is, is it recovered? Cause the hamstring could be recovered and you're still going to potentiate another issue because we're lacking again, control of the foot, bracing, pelvis control, all this stuff, control the hip, things are going to drive that to fire aggressively again. Right? Mm -hmm. So, so we need to look at more than that. So I like doing a single leg, um, uh, uh, deadlift with a kettlebell, uh, maintaining excellent spinal position, slightly, uh, uh, unhinged, uh, knee and it's a cross body. So the kettlebell is going to start, uh, in the hand with the foot that's off the ground. And you, as you go down slowly, this is a very slow movement, slow and controlled, maintaining perfect spinal integrity. You're going to balance and push that kettlebell over to the opposite foot up to the outside. So we've crossed the center line of the body. So the reason for that is uh, we're, it really is priming some things neurologically when, we're, when we cross that center line. And we're looking at balance and control of the hip while we're actually stretching and opening that hamstring and making it fire. Um, so it's a really, really great movement. If you can do that, it shows you have control of the foot. We've got good spinal. All this stuff has to happen. Another one that's a little bit more hamstring specific. So um, this would be like for a good tear in the hamstring. Another uh, drill I would uh, check this with is a single leg uh, glute uh, 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 Swiss ball. Uh, hamstring curl. Mm -hmm. So again, we want to brace really well, neutral spine. Okay. Lock that pelvis into position and bridge, bridge up, pulling that hamstring in. Uh, so you end up in a single leg glute in a single leg glute bridge off of a, a Swiss ball. If you can do both those movements, you're, you're ready. You're, you're ready to return to play. Badass, man. That was way more in depth than I was expecting. What do you, what do you think of this? I've always had, I, I might've gotten this from DeFranco. I've always had people do a good bit, like pretty quickly, a good bit of concentric only work. So usually what that looks like is straight legged sled walks with light weight and straight. Yeah. So straight legged sled walks. And also I'll, I'll put them in a chair and have them, and I'll provide a little bit of resistance by pulling back on the chair and have them do concentric only hamstring curls. So basically they're just moving the chair forward using their hamstrings. What do you think of those? Awesome. So the beauty of concentric only work is the recovery time is much less now. Um, so for, for, for issues like, um, like this, where we talk about being able to do a high level of frequency is going to really stimulate the healing process. Mm -hmm. 
if we're doing concentric only, it makes it much easier to do this daily or multiple times a day. Mm -hmm. um, so the concentric only approach is, it can be really, really beneficial uh, during that time for those reasons, uh, because the eccentric loading is going to cr create a lot more, you know, delayed onset muscle soreness. Uh, it's going to, you know, it takes more time to recover. Um, and this is the reason, it, you know, if you've got a, a, a lift, um, let's say like an Olympic lift that is a concentric only based movement, those lifters are lifting every time, you know, every day or pretty, pretty closely because you also have to, if that's your style of training, right. because the window is a, just a much different window uh, versus same thing with a uh, you watch an Olympic lifter do squats. They do a, it like almost as a concentric only. And again, much more common to see frequent daily squats that way versus a more powerlifting eccentric based slower look, squat, which is going to result in a heavier weight moved, but also substantially increases the, uh, the recovery time. Right. Um, this is where I see people get confused, like, well, these people do that. Well, it's a different training style, different, right. whole different actions happening. Um, but um, I love this. Uh, and I actually do this approach with like upper body back movements and stuff a lot. Mm -hmm. So uh, like face pulls, it's great if somebody is kind of lacking that engagement and the mobility scapula, you know, the ability for the scapula to move. If you do a normal like face pull, you can only do it a few times a week. But if I do it with a sled so that it's concentric only. I could have them do it every day, mm -hmm. right? So we're engaging that movement and we're actually moving and pushing range of motion and all this sort of stuff during that period of time. So yeah, definitely a good application for that. Awesome, man. What's one resource that you'd recommend to all coaches listening to the show? Hmm. I would recommend uh, checking out our movement web portal. So, you know, not to pimp my own stuff, but I'll pimp my own stuff. <laughs> uh, www.kabuki, K-A-B-U-K-I dot M-S. So we've got hundreds of these uh, um, uh, movements on the uh, – uh, corrective exercises on there. Uh, it's all indexable. So you could search by shoulder, hamstring, uh, any, any, or, you know, type in keywords. Uh, we've got a private forum where you can ask and our coaches will respond to questions on there. Uh, so an incredible resource, unfortunately it's, it's a video library, so it doesn't like encompass our entire philosophy and some of the stuff that we have here. So if you really want to walk through a comprehensive, like how we assess, and how we work through issues through the entire body and through uh, a more systematic approach to, you know, interaction between uh, trainers, physios, so on. You know, when do we, when are we applying uh, soft tissue work? When are we doing uh, corrective exercises? When are we outsourcing? When are we, you know, all this stuff, uh, our seminar series. And we've got 12 of them, I think, booked next year, one every month uh, throughout the U.S. You can find that on Kabuki Strength under education as well. Um, that's a... That, that's a, it's a really, really incredible piece. Um, we teach the same seminar actually as a private, uh, seminar. Um, so I can't name the teams, but, uh, we work with, uh, basically all the, all the best MLB teams out there and, uh, and training their staff. And it's the same, same methodology. Um, and we work with, uh, so many collegiate sports, uh, uh, athletes as well, uh, or sorry, uh, uh, coaching staffs as well. So, um, pretty extensive work, uh, through all those fields. Cause this, this stuff applies, this isn't uh, powerlifting CrossFit right. type stuff. This is, this is human movement and, uh, under load and not many people are really breaking down. Like, what does that mean? And what's the difference between, uh, more of a clinical or, uh, uh, you know, theory approach or how I deal with a sedentary athlete and how, or a sedentary individual, uh, with, that the research has been on, done on versus how actually to deal with people that are active athletes. And that's where we, that's where we specialize in. Very cool, man. I'll have to check that out. I, I like how it's dot MS was kabuki.com dot net dot org all taken, uh, movement systems. Well, got actually, it, it's like Madagascar. It. It's like Madagascar or something like yeah. I don't know what Moldova and Slovenia or something like that. But yeah. it's it's Kabuki movement system. So I, I thought it was catchy. I like so. it, man. I like it. Yeah. Cool, man. This has been phenomenal. It's been really nice to, like I said, like I, I almost never talk about this kind of stuff because I, I think most people have, um, they have so much of their own agenda that I can't get a real true take on it. Um, and, there, and a lot of people aren't trustable, but it's been really refreshing to have your perspective on this. So I really appreciate it, man. 
Thanks, this, this ends round two, man. It's been yeah. great. Remind I appreciate me. you re- yeah, recognizing that uh, because we have a philosophy around movement and loading and all of our products and education are just what we see as, uh, as gaps out there. And we're truly just, I had, I got a very successful career that I could go back to. So does my business partner. Like we do this because it's, it's our passion. Mm-hmm. And so even when I'm talking about, you know, the products and education stuff on, on the podcast here, it's, I say pimping it, but like, it's cause I'm passionate about it. And I want to share, I want to share and reach more people. Right. Um, because we want to have, our, our mission is to help people live better through strength. And, and that's what we're about. Love it, dude. So they can find you, I know at kabuki strength.com and that's K A B U K I strength.com. And then yep. where can they keep up with you on the interwebs on the, uh, the socials? Okay. Uh, I'm most active on Instagram, uh, which is mad underscore scientist underscore Duffin. Um, but, uh, I'm also on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, all that sort of stuff as well. Um, Facebook, we do a lot of, uh, reposting of the articles on my, uh, athlete page. So every day there's, uh, articles and stuff popping up there. They should come up on LinkedIn as well. Um, and then, uh, more of my own personal stuff, what's going on in my life and all that is usually, uh, usually Instagram and we're reposting um, content that's useful uh, primarily on that page. But we have the the company page and our coaching pages that are dedicated to that uh, as well, which are just Kabuki Strength. Uh, you can find it. Awesome. <laughs> Should man. be links on the website too. Awesome, brother. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. It's uh, been a pleasure. Hey, guys. If your biggest goal right now is to lose body fat and or build lean muscle mass, then we have something cool for you. And it is called, wait for it, the Brute Body Shred Manual. I know it's a super cool title. So this is a short ebook that includes 27 different tips on building lean muscle mass and losing body fat. It includes a six week pull up progression, some different programming for building uh, lean muscle. We have fat loss myths in here. We talk about how to eat for body composition goals and a ton of different things that you can implement immediately or just things that are kind of mindset shifts that can help you reach your goals over the long term. And you can get access to this by going to brutestrengthtraining.com backslash SM, brutestrengthtraining.com backslash SM. And this is a free guide. Take advantage of it. Hope you enjoy. This episode is finished, but your training journey continues. Head over to BruteStrengthTraining.com slash SSW and grab your free pack of 32 accessory workouts that you can incorporate into your training and start improving your strength immediately. That's BruteStrengthTraining.com slash SSW.